Now, the endorsement of Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi by former President Olusha Gorbassonjo has set tongues wagging. The Presidential Campaign Council, PCC of All Progressives Congress, described the endorsement of Obi by Obasanjo as useless, alleging that the former president hardly has strong electoral value. The People's Democratic Party reacted in like manner, saying whether Obasanjo likes it or not, Atiku would be president in his lifetime. The question many ask is, if the endorsement of Peter Obi by Obasanjo holds no value, why are opposition parties getting worked up by it? Joining us on the show this morning to discuss this and the All Progressives Congress campaign activities as we start the year 2023 is Festus Keamo, SAN spokesperson for the Tinubu Shetima Presidential Campaign Council. Welcome to the morning show. Thank you for inviting me today. Good morning. Well, I think the question has already been posed in the introduction. Why is your party, the All Progressives Congress, getting worked up by reports of endorsement of the candidate of the Liberal Party uh, by key persons, key figures, influential figures, including President Olusha Gombasanjo, Chief E.K. Clark, and most recently, uh, Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State. Well, um, it's uh, if your interpretation of um, issuing uh, simple statements and reacting to those um, endorsements and putting them in proper context, if um, those um, statements appear to you to be um, to be a sign of being worked up, then it's um, not true. Uh, you cannot say that once you react to such statements and then, of course explain to the public why uh, those endorsements may not have any effect on your candidates. Uh, that is not being worked up because this is a campaign season and uh, it's important that you don't allow anything to go unanswered uh, because you never know those who may be influenced by such, uh, by such things. We understand that the much younger generation, uh, they are the target of some of these endorsements. And some of us, uh, you sitting down there who is an ace journalist and, you know, a couple of your colleagues there, uh, they should understand uh, our trajectory, our history, more than the much younger generation. And they understand, of course, where we are coming from um, in this country. So uh, you may not even need explanation, but the younger ones, the much younger ones, they need some explanation to let them know who these elders um, are, the roles they are played, in our nation before, and why, of course, uh, they should not listen to such um, endorsements. Because such endorsements, they come with some kind of stamp of um, uh, sanctimony, okay? And then um, the history of some of these um, leaders tell you that they are not as sanctimonious as they come across. You know, so it's not being worked up, really, if you ask me, it's not. All right. Uh, so the, thank you for talking about track record, because a salient point that the former president made beyond his endorsement of the Liberal Party's candidate is his assessment of this tenure under your party, the APC, and under which you also serve as Minister for State for Labour and Employment. Um, he looked at, he said Nigerians are living in hell on earth. He said that we've moved from frying pan to fire. He talked about the fact that, you know, people, Nigerians are not getting the best deal under this government. And to put some merit to that, we have double inflation figures. We just spoke about the, uh, the, the budget for 2023, the highest deficit position since 1999. These are key issues that you cannot ignore. What's your take on this? Well, I think it's very simple. Um, that is why we talk about telling the younger generation some of the history of this um, uh, elders. Uh, I want to ask a rhetorical question, so I don't expect an answer from you. From Since Abbas and John left power in 1970, first of all in 1979, and then before he came back again, of course, uh, you know, for eight years as a civilian uh, president, tell me one government, just one, one, that Abbas and Joe, uh, did not pillory like this. Abbas and Joe did not come hard on. For him, it's just a pastime now, whether it is true or false. He was hard on the Shagari government after he handed over to Shagari. He came down hard on the IBB government. Remember, he said, if IBB told you at that time, good morning, you have to go outside to check whether it is morning or not. He came down hard on Abacha, ended up in prison because of that. 
And then he came in. It was only himself he did not criticize. And after he left, he came down hard on the Arab one, then Jonathan's government, and on and on like that, on Buhari's government. So when you become, uh, when, you, when you take such part, people don't listen to you too much again. In 2019, Obasan just said worst things of the Buhari government. I was the chief spokesperson at that time too, to the Buhari's government, and we replied in point for point. And at the end of the day, 15 million Nigerians did not listen to him. At least they voted for us. That is why they did not listen to him. So, if it is so, we are also saying to that so many Nigerians now are not also listening to him because we have come through this part before with Obasanjo. All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, but isn't it amazing? And good to see you. Happy New Year, my very good friend and brother. Thank you. I have to wake up 3 a.m. to do this. Ah, I can um, imagine. This is 3 a.m. here in New York. Yeah, hey, so sorry for <laughs> taking you away from your, you know, rest no and your holidays. But good to see you again, my brother. But isn't it amazing what a lot of people say that what your party says smacks of hypocrisy? This same Obasanjo you are abusing now was the one that endorsed President Muhammad Buhari in 2015. And, you know, Supported him in 2015. Then he was an elder statesman that meant well for Nigeria against Jonathan. But now he's a villain, isn't it? And let's go to the issues. A lot of people say your government has failed. Look at just yesterday. I don't know if you've been following the news. The president of the country begging the National Assembly to break the law of the land, the CBN Act, because they had borrowed 22 trillion in ways and means they can't account for. Now they are trying to securitize. You have been a minister of state for labor. But under you and all your work, over 33% unemployment rates, and if the MBS released the numbers today, it will be higher than that. So that's a colossal failure on the part of the government. Over to you. Happy New Year to you, my friend. Well, thank you. Let me, let me come to the first um, point you made about um, visiting Obas and Joe and seeking his endorsement. It has become traditional in Nigeria these days to just visit past presidents who are considered as elder statesmen, as a mark of respect when you want to run for president. It's just a mark of respect when you visit them. People visit IBB, of course, you know, Hilltop has become like, you know, a Mecca. You know, they visit Abdul Salam Abubakar. They visit Jonathan, of course, you know. Um, and then it's that, that same, you know, um, itinerary that takes them to people like um, Obasanjo. It's not that people go to actively seek an endorsement to, to win elections. So I want you to put that in a proper context, really. In 2015, he was already disruptive of um, his, you know, PDP and his activities within PDP. It's not like, oh, well, we, we consciously sought his endorsement. We visited him as a matter of mark of respect. And it was not that he came out to endorse, you know, Buhari and campaign for him like the way he did for Atiku and the way he's doing for Buhari, uh, Obina. He had his problem with his... Um, Puppets he put in government then, which was um, Jonathan. Jonathan he was handpicked. Jonathan was handpicked by him, and he felt that Jonathan was not doing his bidding. And then, of course, you know, it became very disruptive of um, uh, the activities of PDP. Then, uh, I'm sure your brother uh, there, uh, my big brother uh, Ruben Abati, of course, had his hands full then because he was the spokesperson to Jonathan at that time. You know, so it was not that uh, we consciously you know, his endorsement to win any election. It's a mark of respect to visit um, heads of state these days. And that is why. On the issue of um, uh, MBS figures and the unemployment figures, they are not salutary. We, as, we, we agree that they are not salutary. But our post-recovery efforts now, post-COVID recovery efforts, is one of the best in the world. Because you know that um, unemployment skyrocketed all over the world after the COVID-19 pandemic. We were 23% before, before the COVID. After COVID, it jumped to 33%. And don't forget that this is a accumulation of different levels of government, unemployment in different levels of government. Uh, don't uh, tell Nigerians, don't, tell, don't, don't put it across to Nigerians as if employment is only the, the, the work of the federal government, it's only the burden of the federal government. If you look at the MBS figures, my brother, I'm sure you have looked at them. They went state by state too. Some of the PDP states are the highest in terms of unemployment figures. The states they have a duty to employ. The local governments have a duty to employ. Our federal government have a duty to employ. So, and also, we also have the duties, all levels of government, to also create that, you know, environment. If we're not employing, but to create the environment 
by which we can stimulate, you know, employment, both at the micro and macro level, you know, and the medium scale level. You know, so th these figures, like I said, go and look at the statistics. I can start rolling them out now, but time will not allow us. But that unemployment skyrocketed all over the world. And like Nigeria, Nigeria, our effort, our post-COVID recovery effort is one of the best in the world. Even, you know, uh, put it side by side with very, you know, uh, big nations. Okay, um, two things. The first is, would the reaction of the APC Presidential Campaign Council have been different if President Obasanjo had endorsed your presidential candidate, Ashwa Jutunubu? Uh, will it still be, have been said that uh, Obasanjo has no electoral value? Uh, he cannot even recommend anybody for councillorship. Would the reaction have been the same? But the main question, just to move the conversation uh, forward, I'd like to ask you, what is happening with your presidential campaign council? Two persons have just resigned from that presidential campaign council. The gentleman from uh, Niger State, I think his name is Ibetu or so, he says that, uh, you know, there's too much conflict within the party, uh, too many litigations and all of that. Then the second person from the Northeast said, look, he's uh, disassociating himself and leaving the party because he does not think that your party uh, has a credible candidate. He, he doesn't consider your presidential candidate, uh, you know, credible. Is this an indication of deeper crisis at this point? Just uh, a few weeks to the election within the All Progressives Congress. Well, let me take the first one first about uh, Boston Joe's endorsement and how, what our reactions would have been. Because we are more experienced politically, we wouldn't have... Um, be popping champagne the way our younger friends in Labour Party are popping champagne now because um, they really don't um, know um, the political influence on some of these people. So if Obasanjo had endorsed us, we would have taken it now, you know, in our stride, you know, we would have been happy. But of course, we will not rest our words. We will not pop champagne. We will not dance to the streets like some of them are doing as if they had won the election with Obasanjo's endorsement. You know, we are, we are going to come as to the general, you know, uh, influence of some of these endorsements after this. I guess we're going to come to that because I want to go into those deeper issues. You know, so that's to answer the first, uh, to react to the first comment you made. Uh, the second comment um, really is, um, remind me, you were saying about... Um, about... Uh, okay, yes, about resignations. Yes. About resignation. Yes. Today... I also read in the news that uh, there's a lot of disruption in PDP Katsina, a lot of people are leaving the party. So this has happened in local um, local setting in parties within uh, the country. Uh, it happens to all the parties. Uh, LP, Labour Party had some problems within their Labour Party too, here and there, in different chapters. So these things are very local issues, local chapters of the party, and problems and contradictions and quarrels among party members. It happens. The only thing you know, you look at as a politician is to see what is the influence of these people who are resigning um, and what kind of influence would they have, um, you know, brought to bear on our results and our, you know, electoral fortunes within those states. Uh, once we need every vote. Uh, so let me make it very clear that we regret to lose any member at all. We regret. Yes, we do. But on the overall, overall, at times we look at those are left behind, those who are still there to steer the ship of the party. And once that we think we are confident that um, those people left behind are still uh, worthy enough to carry our cause, we go home happy. But we are regret to lose them, no doubt. But like I said, these are things that happen during, you know, election season like this here and there. You know, and it happens to all parties. And so it's nothing to celebrate. I saw a statement issued by PDP yesterday over the guy that issued resigned from Niger, and they were so gleeful. They were gleeful, they were just issuing a statement. You know, we have not done so in respect of all the problems happening within, you know, the PDP. Five governors revolting and say they won't campaign for their their candidates, uh, and all of that. We, we are just watching. We are not as excited as they were when just one person, who is not even the leader of the party, who I don't think comes, uh, you know, within the first 10 hierarchy of the leaders of the party in the state, says he's resigning from the party. We're not as excited as they were, you know. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, thank you. I'd like to, I have two questions for you. One is to revisit the question I'd asked earlier, because in, in, in speaking to the merits of former president, Olusha Gombasanjo's statement, you spoke about his, um, the credibility of him speaking, but not the issues that he talked about, which is the state of the economy, the plight of Nigerians. And so I'd just like to ask you directly, um, Mr. Fesos Kayamo, are Nigerians in a better position now than they were when, your, when the president took, um, first came into office? Bearing in mind that despite how well you handled COVID, COVID is not, a, is not the only marker of how well your government has done. And then the second thing is to speak about endorsement. So there were stories around the G5 governors of the PDP going to London and in, on that trip meeting with your presidential candidate, Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu, and they said that on this trip, there were conversations as to them supporting his presidential bid. I'd like you to speak to this. Is this false? Is this true? And then in the event that they, they do support your candidates, what would this mean for the APC? All right. Um, the, the, the first one um, is about um, how well we have done. The simple answer is that we, we, we could have been in a worse worst case um, scenario right now, if not the efforts we made uh, to steer the economy away from disaster. And I said this with all sense of seriousness, because I know some people may snigger at this and say, well, you know, uh, what am I saying? Because uh, the normal things they hear on, on uh, the, the social media and, you know, uh, the orthodox media, that they just throw figures at them. Rice was this before, rice is this now, tomatoes. Were. I know these things are important. To, to the ordinary persons. Don't forget, don't, don't misquote me, they are. But sometimes they forget to tell them, you know, the, the, where we were when they handed over in 2015, how the economy was doing. Now the PD people will come and tell you all kinds of figures. The, the economy was, was, um, uh, was uh, the best in Africa and all of that. But despite that, and I mentioned it on another forum yesterday, despite that, all the people who served them in economic capacity, the Minister of Finance, CBN governors, Soludo, who is a, gov who is a, who is a, who is a, um, a governor now of Anambra State, Mohamed Sanusi, they were all very emphatic. And I want you to fact check me. They were emphatic that whoever wins the 2015 election was going to inherit a mess of an economy. They all said so. Okonjo Awala said we were headed for recession before they handed over to us. So what it means, therefore, is that I'm quoting from them that by their own Ipsy Dixit, they knew they were handing over a mess to us. So the point now is that we would have been in a, in a worst case scenario now, if not for the deft way that President Muhammad Buhari handled the economy. Our sister countries around, many of them have collapsed entirely. Ghana has been declared bankrupt because we operated under the same you know, conditions. So let us, I, I'm saying this with all sense of seriousness because the ordinary persons will not know. They just bandy figures at them and they get carried away at times or they get deceived. They are deceived by them. But despite all of this, my brothers and my sister there, despite all of this, we made tremendous progress in infrastructural development. So much that in, the, in 16 years of PDP, and that's why all the money is the end, they did not even you know, get 10% of the kind of infrastructural development that we achieved with the paucity of funds and the harsh economic conditions that we inherited from the PDP. So that's a fact. So the, to answer you directly, we could have been in a worst case right now, worst case scenario right now. That is the, that's the fact. Then to go on to your next uh, question, um, just remind me. On, on, on the trip, the G5 governors, they are meeting, oh, yes. they are well, well, meeting well, well, with. Well, both sides denied it. So let me, let me start from that premise. Mm. Both sides denied it. But if they were to endorse us, it's going to be an additional pet to our projection. Because in an election, you need everybody. You need everybody. So there are not people we can discard. We need them. In election, you need everybody. So if they were to endorse us, we would be excited by it because they are the major, some of the major pillars of PDP. And they are the major, some of the major wheels of PDP. 
And with this endorsement and rebellion within the PDP, the truth of the matter, really, is that this election appears to be over already. It's a one-horse race already. I'm not saying this, I'm not hyping our candidate because, oh, well, I'm the spokesperson. But any close watch out events should know by now. So the results should not shock anybody when it comes. If PDP does so badly, the results should not be a surprise to anybody. The problems are just too many. They are mounting for the PDP, both in and out of the PDP. Every single person that supported the PDP in 2019 against us, not even the core PDP members, Ohaneze, like I said, endorsed article in 2019. Middle Belt Forum endorsed article in 2019. Pandef endorsed article in 2019. Afeni Fere endorsed article in 2019. OBJ endorsed article in 2019. Pade Banjo endorsed article in 2019. All of these points I mentioned that they pulled out. They pulled out and supported the Labour Party. So when we said at the earlier part of this campaign that Peter OB is the greatest weapon that Ashiwaju has, that Inubu has. People did not understand what we are saying. I can say it openly now because I know it's too late, too late for him to pull out. I can say it openly. But Ashi Peter Obi is the biggest reason Ashiwaju will win this election. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, on a lighter note, on the day of swearing in, I will beg that Peter Obi is given the front, front seat role on that day of swearing in. We sit near Ashiwaju as his best friend. Okay. And the reason why he's being sworn in as president, okay. Peter Obi should sit on the front row on that day. Okay. I mean, very good. Uh, but let's go back to the failures of the APC, which the wife of the president even confirmed by begging. But you know, they are alleged failures. No, no. Don't use the word failures. Please, they, they, please. They, they no, no, alleged. no, no, no. Mr. Kiamo, you asked for, let's pipe things down. We've been civil. Let's just continue this way. Let me finish talking. Now you are interrupting me, Mr. Kiamo. Let's keep things civil, no, all right? I'm, I'm just trying to... I'm just trying Mr. To Kiamo, you see, you see, I'm sure the things. world sees that you're the one interrupting me now. Let me finish my okay, statement. Okay, go ahead. All right, okay, the failures of the APC, which are too numerous to mention, one of the longest strike in recent times, ASU strike, the JAPA syndrome, the poor economy, the fact that as Minister of Labor, we've not had employment for the people, youth unemployment on the high, the fact that you'll be leaving one of the biggest debt burden behind. So when you were saying in 2015, everybody knew that Nigeria was headed for dire strait. People are even more skeptical about the future after this your government leaves because you've left so much debt behind you've crippled the economy you're trying to tax everybody and you keep breaking the laws you know what you're doing now for the first time you've signed in the budget the president has signed in the budget but he's not signed the finance bill you are a lawyer you know that's at variance with the laws on ground he skips that so the failures keep mounting i don't know how you're going to defend all of this litany of failures Secondly, you say endorsements don't count the dime a dozen. They don't count so much, yes, and I believe you. So much that your party had to divide their Fanny Ferry after Payo Debanjo endorsed Peter Obi. Then there was a going to Parfashion Roti at the back to seek his endorsement, and he gave it. So now we have for the first time a Fanny Ferry, two greater Fanny Ferry leaders endorsed two different people. And you say endorsements do not count a lot. Two questions, please, as we wrap up. The first one was not a question. The first one was a comment. So that's why I was correcting you. You were saying the economy has failed, blah, blah, blah. That was not a question. So I would prefer that we move this discussion out of this forum so you don't sit down there as an, a journalist. Move two of us as co-debaters to somewhere, and then we debate it, me and you. I was expecting that you were there to ask questions and not to debate with me. So next time, move this forum away from question answer, move it to code debater, because you are making statements, emphatic statements that I tell you I disagree with. You say the economy has failed, I disagree with you, because it has not failed. It has not failed because yeah, right now, like I said, we have one of the best recovery rates, and IMF has confirmed that. We came out of post-COVID better than and quicker than IMF projected. And I'm giving you facts. And when I give you facts at times, like I said earlier, when you have uh, memorized something to pour out, you just keep pouring it out without taking note of the facts. I told you about the unemployment rate and the fact that multi levels of government are involved and it was all a worldwide issue post COVID that is shut up. But you keep reporting the same issues. So I would prefer that we both go and debate somewhere instead of you asking me questions here. 
That is to answer you. That's to reply you on that, first of all. I, I disagree with you. And then you talk about the borrowing. The borrowing, people can easily see the infrastructure that we have built as a result of borrowing. And then, you know what? When people borrow you, we are credit worthy. It means that they rate your economy so good that you can pay back. Because these are things that will reflect the economy. It's only by infrastructure you can reflect the economy. And the economy will do so well that we can pay back you know, these, uh, these loans. Don't mm -hmm. forget, too, that in Africa, our, our debt to you know, uh, GDP ratio is the best. Right? Go and check for the big nations in Africa, of Egypt, of Kenya, of South Africa, of Ghana. Our debt to GDP ratio is one of the best. So if the world considered us credit worthy, and we have not, don't forget too, we have not also reached the IMF you know, ceiling of 55%. We're still doing about 25, 30% of our debt to GDP ratio. Other African countries are doing 80%, 90%, 70% above the IMF you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, ceiling. So I disagree with you. Next time, move us to be co-debaters who will debate this issue. On the second issue uh, regarding our, our budget, you know, at the last point, when we want to, we want to live on a high. There's nothing. There's nothing bad about, you know, asking for uh, supplementary budgets and approval of many. We can always rectify that. We will rectify it at the, at some point. We will rectify it at some point. But there's nothing wrong. We have always asked for, you know, supplementary budgets, and the National Assembly have always approved our supplementary budgets. And at some point, we will, you know, rectify that. Well, uh, first of Kiamo, it has been observed that President uh, Muhammad Ubari has not been uh, campaigning actively for the candidate of the APC, Ashwa Jutinubu. Unlike in the past, you recall uh, in 2007, you will even think that uh, it was President Obasanjo running in that race. It was all over the place campaigning for uh, then uh, as he became President Tumaru Yaradwa. But uh, the president this time around, um, maybe he's busy concentrating on his work, but it looks a bit unusual that as chairman of the campaign, he's not out there in the forefront and raising the hand of the candidate of your party. Is the president just being neutral, uh, you know, telling against to make their choice? Um, let me, let me uh, quickly answer the question. I also um, forgot to answer that uh, my brother, the Rufai, asked. Um, I'm sorry, I, I skipped that about endorsement, that we said endorsement don't say, uh, matter. Uh, we, we, we don't say endorsement don't matter. We only say that they may not carry the required, you know, uh, weights that many people, you know, ascribe to those endorsements. And these ones in particular, these particular ones we're talking about, that did not affect us in 2019. Now, you said we went to divide affinity. That's an unfair comment unfair because it is judgmental you did not ask a question you just made a judgmental comment that we went to divide our family that is really not fair everybody saw the events that played out the events are played out in the sense that a particular person without consulting anybody within our family without consulting even his own his even his driver if i want to put it you know in a hyperbel hyper, you know, hyperbolic way he went ahead and announced that the whole of our Ferry is endorsing Peter Obi. As a Democrat sitting down there, a journalist, would you accept that kind of leadership of an organization? And then the other elders within the organization, without our prompting, protested and said, how did you do this to us? Who did you talk with? He said, and you saw him on, on TV, and it was on your station arise. I was watching that day, Rufai. He said, that is how we do it in our Ferry We don't need to consult anybody. We have been doing like that from the time of our law work. Abba, Abba. How can you do that? And then the other people protested. And then they now ascribed it to us that we divided the Fenifere. How unfair can that be to us when the other elders who were not consulted now protested? And they came together in the ceremony, invited our candidates. You saw all the elders, the Ulufa line, all of them. You know, much more than Adebanjo that was even given you know, an acting leadership role. And they all endorsed our candidates. How could that be our fault? If you, if you as a politician, you see people who are, you know, tilting towards you, would you accept their endorsement? Would you run away to say, okay, because I don't want to divide the organization, please don't come and endorse me. 
I mean, that would have been that would that would have been you know stupid of us. So please, that's the answer to that. Now, as to President Buhari and his um, supposed supposed lukewarm attitude towards um, Ashiwaju. Now, simple question. Let me let me let me make mockery of our you know opponents first on that issue. I thought they said President Buhari had no influence. <laughs> so why are they so excited about that? Why are they worried about that? That how will Ashiwaju, how will President Buhari support Ashiwaju? They are watching out. They are watching out. I thought they said he, he did not win the 2019 election. In one breath, they tell you that President Buhari did not win the 2019 election, that they were rigged out. In another breath, they now tell you that eh, Ashiwaju will not, will not enjoy the influence of President Buhari. Oh, so President Buhari has influence? You admit? You know that? All right. You know that what he brings to the table is huge. Now, let me tell you, let me answer you directly. Um, my, my big brother. President Buhari is not like an Obasanjo who wants to install a puppet. You saw what he did in 20, 2007. That was not salutary. I mean, to all patriots, where he said, it, that was when the do or die you know, uh, mantra came up. If you remember, sir, that it was then that he said this election was a do or die affair for him. Now, a leader should not behave like that. And President Buhari is way above, shoulders above President Obasanjo, you know, in this respect. All right. He's, he, he was there at our flag. Up. I'm sorry, I, I know I'm taking some time. He was here, there at our flag up in Jaws. That was enough support at that time. As time goes on, he's going to make some macu, you know, appearances here and there to show that he's supportive. But at the same time, he wants to show the world and African leaders that he's aloof to the point that he can conduct free, fair elections. It is not a do or die affair for him. He supports our candidate as the as the chairman of the campaign council, as the leader of the party. But he is not going to come down into the arena so much right. as to show that he wants to use state power Thank and incumbency to swing it to one side. Thank you very much, Mr. Festus Kayama, SAN, uh, spokesperson Tinubu Shetima Presidential Campaign Council.